Hi, so in this video I wanted to continue my series on protection techniques that typical uh, anti-malware technologies employ. And again, I'm going to give a high-level overview. Uh, but in this video I'll talk specifically about behavioral detection or behavioral approaches to detecting malware. Uh, now behavioral approaches aim to directly uh, monitor what a process actually does. So in contrast, in, in the previous videos I talked about things like static heuristics where uh, you look at maybe static attributes of a particular file. Uh, and in the video before that I talked about signatures where you look for specific indications. So if you kind of had to visualize and imagine you've got a file on the one hand and a signature might look at specific contents of the file. Uh, a heuristic might also be looking at, con of, uh, at contents of a file but it may be looking for more generic things like maybe uh, patterns that are, that are more general that, that, that maybe aren't captured by specific string matches but that, in, that could be indicative of something being malware. Uh, and then finally, behavioral attributes look at what an application actually does. Uh, so in the previous video I talked about, I gave an analogy rather of trying to determine if a neighborhood is safe. Uh, and one thing you might want to do is, is you can look at police reports, that would be an example of a signature. You could walk into a neighborhood and if you see lots of trash in the roads and maybe some broken windows, that might be an indication that the neighborhood is malicious. And that would be kind of like a, a static heuristic because these are things you could readily observe without having to wait for anything to happen and they can provide one level of indication. Uh, taking that analogy one step further, another thing you can do is to wait and observe the actual neighborhood. For example, let's say you wait a few minutes and then you see two men arguing on the street and one pulls out a gun. Uh, then you might immediately know the neighborhood is not safe and, and get out of there as fast as humanly possible. Now how does this work or how can this relate back to software? So imagine you've got a software application and again software applications are often represented by one or more files running on the file system uh, and these applications might in turn be exhibiting behaviors like for example maybe you see a uh, an application and the first thing it does is it, it hooks the keyboard API so let's see you've got a you know Windows has a, an API that controls the keyboard and so when the keyboard is kind of talking to the to the computer so to speak that communication uh, at the operating system level happens via the keyboard API and a lot of applications might try to hook this API. So they may be, there's actually an opportunity for some applications to kind of interfere with or, or modify what we say is hook, let's uh, say the keyboard API. Uh, and that would be something that a lot of malware might do because some, some pieces of malware uh, try to uh, figure out what your keystrokes are and, and transmit these to a remote server. And then those things are called keystroke loggers. And we talked a bit about that in the overall malware taxonomy. But certainly if you see something hooked in the keyboard API and recording your keystrokes, that could be very suspicious in and of itself. Now suppose you also see the application then taking that data and uh, transmitting it to some remote server somewhere. And, and uh, maybe there's a server somewhere out there and you see that your, your keystrokes are being transmitted to a remote server. And you know maybe even worse, imagine the protocol over which it's happening is, is a non-standard protocol. So may, maybe uh, for some reason the, instead of using like, the web or something like that, maybe maybe the protocol is IRC. So imagine your keystrokes are being transmitted over IRC uh, after something is hooked in the keyboard API. Uh, now that, that already is pretty suspicious in and of itself, but this may not be the entire story. The malware may be doing other things. Like for example, imagine the malware, you see it co make copies of itself. Imagine it, it takes itself, uh, the file takes itself and starts copying itself to multiple parts of the file system. And all of a sudden you've got four or five copies of this file and maybe it's executing itself. And these are things that, that good applications don't tend to do very often or, or pretty rarely do, uh, but malicious applications might tend to do these things more frequently. And so you can see that by observing the behavior of an application, you can start to get an indication that the application is actually malicious as opposed to, to benign. Now I think this approach is conceptually very powerful because you're examining generic behavior. So it's really kind of generic in nature. You're not looking for specific pieces of malware to generic detection capability and it can identify and lead to identifying new malware. So the idea is can you identify stuff that people don't have signatures for that are, that's not previously known to anybody. Now on the flip side when you are actually doing a behavioral type of approach you're, you're letting the malware run on the system and so the malware might do some damage so maybe it can cause damage in that time. Let's say it only runs for a couple of minutes that can be pretty dangerous. Now I would say that most times you need to let malware run for at least a few minutes to figure out what that malware is intending to do on that system. 
And so if you pers if you suspect something is malware and you and you let it run, um, it can cause some damage in that time. Uh, the other thing is that uh, the, the approach is casting a wider net. So it's actually trying to capture all sorts of different stuff. And it may be, uh, it may inadvertently capture files that are good. So you might have false positives. Uh, so for example, and, and I, the motivating example I gave about an application that hooks the keyboard API and then transmits the, uh, the keystrokes over some unknown protocol to a remote server. I mean, actually, a lot of instant messaging applications do that kind of thing. Right? So instant messaging applications can typically will hook the keyboard API. They will typically transmit keystrokes over to a remote server. And oftentimes, that'll happen over a non-standard protocol. And so if you were to just label something as malicious on that basis alone, on those few characteristics, you might inadvertently call a legitimate application, like an instant messaging application, malicious, because it does those exact things. OK? Uh, now, uh, you know, I, I think those are the, the main things. That, the other thing that I would uh, be concerned with in terms of um, of, of using a, uh, uh, a behavioral approach is that behavioral approaches they are more computationally intensive because you have to monitor process behavior. So they are, you know, already I think antivirus software or anti malware software uh, does have uh, uh, a uh, you know a kind of a bad repu bad reputation, and that a lot of times these things are pretty slow on the endpoint. So anything that can that can hinder performance more is not considered a good thing. So you have to be very careful about anything that uh, that tries to hinder performance on the actual endpoint. So hindering performance is something to be concerned with. OK? And especially um, the other thing is, is that, again, when, you, when you're talking about looking at low-level system behaviors, you are using approaches that are inherently a bit less stable on the enterprise. So for example, if you're looking to hook the keyboard API or some other Windows APIs, you're often trying to monitor stuff that's happening at a very low level. And so as a result, um, that can lead to some stability issues. And, and again, uh, it might be fine on a small set of machines or uh, might be fine on many machines. But when you look at some settings where a typical piece of anti-malware software might be deployed literally on many tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or even millions of endpoints, there's a good chance that some of those endpoints will have some aspect of their configuration which then interferes with the ability of a behavioral technology from kind of doing its uh, its good thing or its, its ability to, to actually monitor what's going on. So hopefully that gave you a high level flavor of behavioral techniques and, and they're again very powerful in that they can capture generic malware uh, but they also have a lot of issues in, in that they they do tend to cause some damage, uh, they do tend to allow the malware to cause damage, they will be more false positive prone, they will hinder performance and they will also cause stability issues and so um, oftentimes what happens is vendors will kind of titrate their behavioral technologies to the point where uh, the false positive rate has been kind of reduced to something really minimal, but that also in turn ends up hindering the true positive rate because they, these two things go hand in hand. And what I'll do, maybe I'll do a future video where I'll talk a bit about true positives and false positives and what these things mean in a bit more detail. But I hope that this gives you a good flavor of behavioral techniques. Uh, thanks a lot, and I will see you in the next video.